Could you look at these images? Do you recognize them? How about this? They were made with a simple toy, like this one. It's called a spirograph. Did you have one as a child? I did. I had a little bit of spare time during my summer holidays, and I decided to clean up my attic. I moved from my parents' house not that long ago, and now my attic is filled with things I hadn't had time to unpack. On the bottom of the box with my childhood stuff, I found my old spirograph. The next thing I found myself late at night trying to draw every possible spiral. Here they are. Some of them are pretty simple, others have a more complex structure. Unfortunately, I don't have tools to make extra gears for the spirograph, but I have something better, my PC. I can't use it to make a simple line drawing program. For that, I need to understand how the spirograph works. It consists of the set of external and internal gears. If you insert one gear into the other, stick the pen rod into the hole of the inner gear and start spinning, you will get an unusual and beautiful spiral. Notice that the teeth of the gear are designed to make the wheel move without slipping. So the first thing I will program is a circle that rolls on the line without sliding. The trajectory of a point on the surface of the wheel is called a cycloid. However, the spirograph wheel rolls on the inside surface of the other wheel. In this case, the trajectory of the point is called hypocycloid. Hypocycloids look like stars. This is what the spirograph would draw if its hole were located at the very edge of the wheel. However, the holes in the wheel are at different distances from the center. So I will move the drawing point closer to the center, and we will get a hypotrochoid. This is what the spirograph draws. Furthermore, the final image depends on the radius of the outer and inner wheel. While I was playing with the program, I noticed that the radius values of 30 and 20, 15 and 10 were giving me exactly the same images. This means that the shape of the spirals depends on the ratio of the radius of the outer and inner wheel. This relation determines the shape of the hypotrochoid. Let's call it the letter K. Let's take a look at how exactly the image changes when this coefficient is changed. If the number k is an integer, the image resembles a star with the corresponding number of rays. If the number is rational, meaning it can be represented as a fraction m divided by n, then the image looks like a flower. And the numerator of the fraction determines the number of petals of this flower. If the number k is irrational, meaning that it cannot be represented as a fraction, then the curve is not close and has infinite rays. For example, this is what a flower with a coefficient equal to a square root of 2 looks like. Beautiful, isn't it? Besides changing the k parameter, I can also change the position of the drawing point. But unlike the toy, the program allows me to do impossible things. For example, I can place the drawing point outside the wheel and get pictures that cannot be drawn with the spirograph. Once you start doing impossible things, it's hard to stop. Why not position the wheel itself outside as well? The curves that the point draws on the surface of the outer wheel are called epizocloids, and at some distance from the center, epitrochoids. Among these epitrochoids, there are pretty famous spirals. If both circles are the same, the petrochoid is called Pascal's snail. Not after triangle pressure Pascal, but after his father. I'm not the only one who thinks these images look like flowers. Back in the early 18th century, Guido Grandi, the Florentine monk, found a whole family of such curves. Guido was a bit of a romantic guy. For their resemblance to flowers, he called these spirals roses and he named similar spirals on the sphere Clelia, in honor of the Italian mathematician Clelia Borromeo. And if a monk in the 18th century could describe these curves with only pen and paper, indeed I can find something more interesting. We have already drifted quite far from the possibilities of the spirograph. Let's go even further. I'm going to add another circle that will roll around the outer circle. The ratio of the radius of the first circle to the third circle is called the coefficient k2. The second circle moves along the first without slipping. 
This means that the first circle path along the second is equal to the path that the second circle traveled along the first. The third circle also must move along the second circle without slipping. But at what speed? The speed can be anything. In order to determine it, we will introduce another parameter p. It will be equal to the ratio of the path that the second circle traveled along the first to the path that the third circle traveled along the second one. So we have four parameters on which the final curve depends. The ratio of the radius of the first circle to the second, the ratio of the radius of the first circle to the third, the ratio of the paths and the distance to the drawing point. By changing these parameters, I found some pretty exciting spirals. Some of them look like toroids, or as Matt Parker calls them, donuts. As Pascal father did, I will take the opportunity to call this one as Parker's donut. Others are very simple and look more like a fish. But most of the spirals are rather abstract. I'm sure they would have appealed to my art professor, but I wanted to find more conservative spirals. I decided to try to change the spiral parameters in real time and draw the spirals instantly. That way I could observe how changing each parameter affected the final image. Unfortunately, the direct simulation of the movement of circles is too difficult a task for the processor. After all, the program tries to draw the entire spiral in a fraction of a second. Oddly enough, mathematics is the perfect tool for solving problems you've created for yourself. If I find an equation that describe the spirals, the program will draw them much faster. The processor won't have to waste time doing unnecessary calculations, for example, the positions of the circles. I'm only interested in a final image. You can describe a circle using a parametric equation. Take a point on a circle. Its x-coordinate is equal to the radius of the circle multiplied by the cosine of the angle. Its y-coordinate is equal to the radius multiplied by the sine of the angle. If we take all angles from 0 to 360 degrees, we will get all circle points. Such an equation is called parametric equation. That is, the x and y coordinates of the points are described through a parameter, the alpha angle. Now place on this circle the second one of the radius r2. The center of the new circle will rotate on a circle of radius r plus r2. When rotating, the center of the second circle will rotate by the angle alpha and the circle itself by the angle beta. The small circle rolls on the big one without sliding. So the arcs of the circles from the starting point to the end point will be the same. The arcs of each circle can be expressed in the terms of the angles at which they rotate and they radii. From this equation we can express the beta angle through the alpha angle. During rotation the drawing point is rotated by the angle alpha plus beta and is removed from the center of the second circle by the distance h. To get its coordinate we must add to our parametric equation the distance to the drawing point. All that remains is to express the angle of beta through the angle of alpha. This is how the parametric equation of the epitrochoid is derived. The equation of the epi-epitrochoid can be derived similarly. I will not describe this process because I don't want to take away from the pleasure of doing it yourself. As it turned out, this spirals a complicated version of the Rosette curves of Guido Grandi. Parameters k and p determine the shape of the spirals. Parameter K2 performs its shading, and the H parameter determines the thickness of the lines. All the variety of choices left me stumped. I played with the parameters and compared the spirals. Each next one seemed to be more beautiful than the one before. Now that I have an infinite set of curves, how can I stop at one? While I was struggling with this dilemma, I decided to search for publications about such spirals. And I came across a curious article, A Rosé is a Rosé by American mathematician Peter Maurer. Maurer also studied the construction of rose-shaped curves. Maurer approached the question of constructing spirals from a different angle. 
He used a polar coordinate system and connected the points on the petrohoid according to a particular algorithm. But look how similar his results are. In his conclusion Peter warns the reader. Because they are static, the drawings presented in this article cannot do justice to the Rosé program. These words were a revelation to me. One single spiral cannot do justice to all of its beauty. However, by moving the sliders and adjusting the parameters of the spiral, I saw something amazing in the way the spirals changed. A static picture came to life, like a flower growing in a fast motion. And 20 years later, my childhood drawings from the old box came to life on my computer screen. There are undoubtedly many other interesting questions that could be asked. Are the coefficients that describe the shape of the spiral more clearly? What is the equation of the spirals in a polar coordinate system? How will the spirals change with the introduction of the fourth circle? And the fifth? How does all this relate to the Fourier series? I would like to find more answers and many more exciting spirals. But this project took a little longer than I expected and my summer holidays were over. And the attic remained a mess. Perhaps you have time. Try to find the answers and you will experience a delightful feeling. To know that at different times, in different parts of the world, people drew the spirals with a quill or a modern computer. And they were asking the same strange questions. And none of them could do justice to all the beauty of these spirals.